Up next, Aileen Lane from Lane Image Consulting. Her biz is all about helping women to learn to become more confident with the right colours and styles that flatter. Well, I realised a couple of years ago that I hadn't been putting myself first for over 15 years. The kids, the school activities and their well-being, my husband, his work and dreams, my own parents, my husband's parents. The 30s and 40s make so many demands on us. And I think we're the first generation really that this has been happening to alongside careers. And so there's no precedent or rule book and we need to have a midlife kick-ass moment where we wake up and say, stop, smell the coffee, smell the jasmine, whatever floats your boat. So if you're ready to have your midlife kick-ass moment, figure yourself out, find out yourself again, listen in, let's roll. Having successfully launched three businesses, bilingual mum to two and entrepreneur Antonia Bovesan Brown has connected with thousands of people, both French and international since moving to the French Riviera. These connections allow her to speak to successful local businesses and inspirational people about life here on the Côte d'Azur and share it with you. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast with your host, entrepreneur and my mum, Antonia Bovesan Brown. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast, Eileen Lane. Thank you very much, Antonio. I'm delighted to be here. And we, for once, are in the same room. We're not always in the same room. Sometimes I do this over the internet, but we are actually face-to-face with a big silver microphone in the middle between us. Scaring you, no? (laughs) Yes, it's scaring the life out of me. (laughs) (laughs) Don't be scared. We're all friends here. When we first met, I think you may have just landed. You came here with your two boys to do a week of English activities here at Kidderland. And you brought your fluent speaking English boys into my beginner slash intermediate program because that's all we had on. Um, But I was just thinking earlier on, they would have been brilliant at the Golden Tulip Hotel in Valbon in Sofia Antipolis where there was tennis and ping pong. So next time... Next time it's going to be (laughs) Valbon. Yeah, bring them there. And we're taking bookings for April and July. For anyone listening, it's perfect for the bilinguals there. Gorgeous location. Do you know it? Um, No, I don't know it actually. But I'm always looking for activities for my six-year-old boy and my nine-year-old boy. They love activities. Not so much classroom learning, but they love activities like anything involving a ball, really. Yeah, well, we will have loads of balls and swimming and things going on there. Well, that might be a bit more girl orientated. We've got Aladdin and Mary Poppins as the themes in the summer and stuff like that. And myths and legends in April, I think. But I'll put a link in the show notes. So, was that when you first arrived in the Côte d'Azur? We arrived here in December 2017. We didn't start school until January. And I believe then that it would have been the first break from school that I found the activities here in Kiddo Land. And what brought you to the Côte d'Azur? Really a, a lifestyle change. Um, we had lived in Singapore for 18 years. We were looking for more nature for the boys. We wanted to be closer to Ireland because I'm obviously from Ireland. And we, we still wanted some sunshine, you know, because we had lived in Singapore for so long. The thought of moving directly to Ireland did not appeal. Um, so we came here for nature, sunshine and a great lifestyle. You know, when Brexit happened, I remember getting out the map and going, oh gosh, I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. I think Frexit was potentially on the cars at the time. And I've got Irish family, as everyone has, right? And um, I sort of looked at the, the map of Ireland. But when I looked at the places I was considering, I was like, it's level with Liverpool in terms of climate. That's the thing, you get used to the weather here in the Côte d'Azur. Yes, it's, it's the cold, it's the grey um, and it rain. So um, for me, I love the sunshine. My husband loves the sunshine. Um, it makes all the difference in our moods. So to me, yeah, it was all about that. Uh, and as we were talking off air to our hair as well. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the humidity in Singapore. <laughs> it's not possible to have um, a hairstyle there. So... Yeah, um, not that that was top of mind at the time, but... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe deep down it was. So where exactly in Ireland was home for you growing up? So I grew up in Limerick, uh, which is down south, and my husband is from Listowel in Kerry. Um, but we haven't been there for a very long time. I'm out of Ireland now over 25 years. I haven't obviously lost my accent, but I've been gone for a very long time. 
what were you like as a little girl? I was, uh, there's 11 in my family, um, 11 kids, and I was the oldest girl. Um, so I was pretty much in charge of everyone else. And uh, I, I have amazing parents. I had an amazing childhood. Um, and I, I guess I would have been uh, quite a determined, happy, a pleasing child, I would say, yeah. What's a favorite childhood memory from those days? I guess when I think of Ireland and growing up in Ireland, um, what I remember is just being out in nature. We were always outside and we were always building houses. So we spent a lot of time building houses, climbing trees, lighting fires. <laughs> we weren't disposed to. Um, yeah, and just spending so much time with my brothers and sisters. We didn't have play dates or sleepovers because there were so many of us at home. So we just hung out together and played together. And um, yeah, it was idyllic. It was idyllic. It's like an Enid Blyton kind of description. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah, I mean, we, I grew up in a farm and there was animals and yeah, of course it wasn't idyllic, but that's what I remember. <laughs> Great to have that memory though. So how did you spend your 20s and 30s? Um, so I, I went to university in Dublin and that's where I met my husband. Um, I, was, I actually studied biotechnology and I went on to do a master's in food engineering. Um, so very different, obviously, to what I'm doing now. Um, my first job was in a pasta company in Nace, and I stayed there for a year um, on a tech start program. Um, and I was the supervisor in the plant there. Somehow I always end up being in charge of people or ordering people around. <laughs> that would be your then... upbringing. Of those, all those <laughs> Probably, little brothers I was always in charge. <laughs> and then I moved to Bahrain in the Middle East because... Um, and my husband was working there. He wasn't my husband at the time. He was my boyfriend. And I ended up working in um, a dairy company there. So I was, again, the manager there. And we manufactured dairy products and, and other food products. And I was only there for a year before we moved to Singapore. And then um, when we moved to Singapore, I worked with Wyeth, which is um, an infant formula manufacturing company so I worked with them as a production manager for about four years and then I worked in product development for two years um, before I decided to leave and start my image business <laughs> which had absolutely nothing to do with food production. Right. Total, totally not connected. Totally not connected I literally saw somebody come into the plant one day and do a demonstration on colors and I just absolutely loved it could immediately see the difference that it made in people to wear the right color and um, took a leap of faith and started my own business I mean it it took a long time to get um, get get it up and running and obviously I had zero business skills and I had to learn all of those skills by trial and error um, but I absolutely loved it and I loved working with women mainly women and um, Lane Image Consulting, what is the elevator pitch? So the elevator pitch is I show business women how to be more confident and I do that by showing them the most flattering colours and styles to wear. Break it down a bit more for me. So I'm, uh, imagine I'm your typical client. What, what am I? What are the avatar, your typical avatar? Um, so my typical avatar is somebody like myself. Uh, generally speaking, it's a woman. Um, she has her own business. Uh, she's juggling many things in her life, children and husbands and business uh, and a business and probably trying to carve out some time for herself as well um, and take care of herself and do the things that she wants to do in, in her life. So, yeah, it would be very much a person like myself, really. Okay, let's imagine you've got your typical client sitting right beside you. And she's probably someone a bit like me. So I do know my colours-ish, but I haven't necessarily thought about them Okay. for the last 10, 15 years or since whenever my mum did that thing in the 80s, whatever <laughs> was fashionable, you know, the colour me, whatever it was back then. Yeah. And I'm someone who hasn't been focused on me for a while. In fact, I was thinking about this well, a couple of years ago, but I was really thinking about it today because I knew you were coming in. 
And I haven't really been thinking or focusing on myself all told for 18 years because 18 years ago is when I would have got pregnant with number one. Right. And since then, I then fell down in my list of who's number one to think about. Then baby number, you know, you had your husband. I suppose if you even went back to the husband coming in. Yes. You know, that's year 2000 for me. So it would have been 1999 that I would have lost, you know, really put myself forward in that sort of 20s, you know, when you're in your 20s and you're thinking just about yourself. Yes. So you kind of know your colours, but you probably haven't thought about them for years. So what are you saying to that typical client that's right there that's maybe a bit afraid or doesn't think they need it or... The first thing I say is, generally speaking, you know the colours that work for you, but you probably find it very hard to um, go out there and be objective about yourself and pick the colours that work for you um, routinely. Um, what I mean by that is um, it's a bit hit and miss. So sometimes you get it right, sometimes you won't get it right. You don't really have you know, a formula um, for choosing the colours that work for you. And actually, we use colours in our hair, we use it in our makeup, not just in our clothes. Um, we also use it in our accessories. And there's so many places we use colour without realising it. So knowing the colours that work for you and knowing how to put them together is really, really important. What works for you may not work for me. So, for instance, if you had very bright colouring, you feel very comfortable with a lot of um, colour. But for somebody like me, who has very low contrast and very light colouring, I tend to wear tints, tones and shades of the same colour. So it's not just knowing the colours that work for you, it's knowing how to put them together and taking into consideration your style personality as well. Okay. And, and the message that you want to uh, translate to the world. And I think that's kind of important and probably why your avatar is so niche at 45 to 50, so my kind of age range, is that we've had our first life in a way, mm -hmm. you know, the pre-kids life. Uh, then you go through that sort of buy your clothes in the supermarket because that's where you have time to, you know, shop kind yes. of life. Then they get a bit older and suddenly you can start looking at yourself, you're earning a bit more, you've got a bit more disposable income. And, and the shops that you knew have moved on. Mm -hmm. So things that, you know, I can't go now to Topshop and New Look and... Yeah. And there's a distinct lack of those mid-range mm. uh, shops, you know. Because, yes, at this point, we want to spend a little bit more on our clothes. Uh, we want better quality. We definitely don't want to be going out in six months and buying the same item again. And we also know at this stage that we're not going to buy fast fashion or things that you know, will do us for a short period of time. We have a fair idea now of what works for us and what doesn't work for us. Um, so that's why I'm here. I'm an objective eye. I can help you do that. And it's true what you said about they're not having that middle market because mm. I was looking at the weekend, actually. I was looking at colours and, and then I was like, okay, what is someone my age? Where do they shop? Where do they shop? Mm. You know, Marks and Spencers, that kind, they're all a bit old-fashioned you know, for my age, I think, anyway. Right. But then the top shop is, like you say, too fast fashion. And that finding that middle ground is kind of tricky. And I was walking in Cannes with um, my husband, Mr. Vivi. We sort of went and had a look at the shops. And I think, I was trying to say this to you the other day, is my tone, so I've got the Irish complexion, right, that doesn't tan down here. <laughs> the problem is that most people do tan down here in the yes. south of France. So they must have a different tone to me right and so all the colors in the shops are not suited for my tone correct i mean i i've noticed since i got here um that a lot of the french have dark hair and dark eyes so they tend to fall into that deep warm category where you know all the warm colors tend to suit them the oranges and the yellows and the turquoise and the corals and gold and all the very bright colors that you see in this part of the world but yes, if you have cooler skin tones, um, lighter colours tend to suit you. But it's, it's, it's also going back to the point that I mentioned earlier, that if you have light colouring like me and you, you often look better in tints, tones and shades of the same colour rather than a lot of bright colour. 
I mean, for instance, if you put orange on somebody that has cool, light skin tone, it completely takes over and you don't actually see them. Whereas when you put people in the right colors, it's like a mini facelift. Their skin looks better, their hair looks better, any lines or any uh, pigmentation in the skin pretty much completely disappears. The amount of makeup you need to wear is much, much less. So finding the right colors for you and wearing them in the right combinations really makes a huge difference in, in your appearance and uh, how you appear to other people. And as you're talking there, two things come to mind. One is, oh gosh, she's looking at me in my colours now, in the same way that you're looking at my microphone. <laughs> I get that for you. And the other thing, so the positive is, I'm married to kind of someone with dark hair, Mediterranean skin, clear, light eyes, but he always goes for, you know, the burnt umber, the, the orange, which I hate orange. Right. Uh, because I know that on me, I just look like a carnival. <laughs> it just looks stupid. Um, and so it is difficult then when you come to designing your house, actually, if you, you know, tend to go for different colours because of what suits you, pleases you, calms you. Yes. And you're with someone that has very different... Oh, yeah. It's like all aspects of marriage. You have to try and find <laughs> a, a compromise. And just this morning, I was speaking at a little cafe in Valbon, uh, which is one of my favourites, actually. Um, so if you're looking for a nice place to go for a cup of coffee... Uh, check out the Little Green Cafe in Valbon. Cute place, yeah. Really cute. Great little Buddha bowls. Gorgeous. Mm. And and Claire runs that um, little cafe there. She started it up herself. She actually used to work for Galderma. So she's a businesswoman who started her own business there. But she has decorated the cafe in the colours that suit her. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Because I was just there this morning. I was here, oh my God, she's all of the colors that suit her on the walls and a lot of people do that they de decorate their houses in the colors that suit them because we are drawn to the colors that suit us we feel at home in the colors that suit us and the, it's like waving a magic wand when you do somebody's colors they immediately feel more like themselves because there's a unity between them and the color and then it's like then they can be themselves yeah. it's a gift it is a gift <laughs> So talk, talk me through a session. We come to a session with you. We rock up in Muja. I get that same <laughs> feeling before I knock on your door as you had before you knocked on mine. Today. Really? I can't believe that people find it scary, <laughs> but it is kind of a step into the unknown. Um, so when people come and see me, first of all, I have a little studio next to my house. So they come and see me in my house. So they meet my dogs. Uh, they usually get, they may even meet my husband on the way in. So they see a little bit of my life. But... Um, I have a lovely little studio, a light-filled studio, and they come in and I offer them a cup of tea or a cup of coffee uh, or a glass of water, and they sit down, and the first 20 minutes to half an hour is actually just chatting. I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about their lifestyle, um, a little bit more of what they're trying to achieve by coming and having a colour analysis done, uh, because people come for all sorts of reasons, and... Oftentimes, it's not really about colour at all in the end. Um, but so, and I do a little uh, personality test because knowing a little bit more about your personality helps me to get the information across to you. Um, uh, usually, usually, I don't have to do much else. I already know your colours from years of doing it. Uh, but I go through a draping process so that to allow you to see what I'm seeing. Uh, and to show you the difference, like say wearing a warm color versus a cool color makes, because it's very, very important for you to mm -hmm. see what I'm seeing, uh, because you're the person that's gonna need to go out there and buy the colors afterwards. Um, I talked to you about, you know, colors in makeup. I talked to you about colors in jewelry. I talked to you about how to put the colors together a little bit. Uh, and really it's just to address any concerns you have around your wardrobe. Oftentimes people will bring along some items from their wardrobe with them because they're not so sure or they don't know how to make it work. Or a lot of people are very concerned that I might tell them that they have to go home and throw out all their wardrobe. I absolutely never do that. So if you have colors in your wardrobe that don't work for you, I'd show you how you can bridge those colors to make them work for you. Because of course nobody wants to go home and throw out their wardrobe. I think having your colours done will save you a lot of time and effort and money in the long term. 
it's it's barely the price of a winter coat and even if you just go out there and buy one winter coat you will cover the cost of this and imagine having a winter coat in the best possible color for you <laughs> <laughs> i like that and of course um you did your wardrobe challenge on I facebook did. i did which it was, was very brave. exciting it was yeah. my first online challenge it was a, a five-day wardrobe weed out challenge and i got 70 women from all over the world some from singapore some from ireland some from, from france and it was it was amazing it was really great i always uh, learn something in the process of doing a course myself um so it was just amazing and uh, and it was great fun it had us well i did mine all in one day in the end but um <laughs> <laughs> just for time i sort of had to to box them all together but every day you gave us a different challenge to do and in the end you're basically getting rid of all the stuff that you don't wear anymore that Maybe it was from a party 10 years ago that's been hanging up there. Sometimes it's very hard to let go of clothes because we have an emotional attachment to them. And like I hear a lot of, but I might wear it again. And I think when you do it in a group like that and you have the group dynamic, it makes it a little bit easier. And of course, a wardrobe weed out is done many times during your life. It's not just done once. So you can go back at any time and go through the process again. And the plan is that I will run it every couple of months. Um, and I'm sure I will have people joining again because every small change that I go through in my own life, I need to weed out my own wardrobe. So it's a very practical process. And how did you feel after it, Antonia? I, I found it liberating. In fact, over Christmas, I did the whole house. I, at Christmas, I was watching Marie Kondo on the Netflix channel and I had some spare time so I literally went through the whole house so I'd done a lot of the wardrobe already actually which was kind of good because I probably would have needed two weeks otherwise <laughs> um but I still I still had stuff to do and I thought it was really good and just to be ruthless actually and just to say I inherited lots of things from my mum was like oh she doesn't need this or my nice. aunt you know they buy from the really nice shops not my shops. Uh, I like to shop there. <laughs> they're not, but not necessarily my colours because they're not the same colours as me. Of course. So I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm now at this age where I'm going to now look a little bit at me. Uh, I was reading about this the other day. The midlife kick ass. <laughs> so going to have a midlife kick ass, not a crisis, and start again and just figure myself out where 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 do I want to be? What do I want to be doing? What fitness level do I want to be at? What do I want to be wearing uh, for the next? decade let's say uh, because you know well it's it's a, it's a bit like finding yourself again because all of those years of just looking after everybody else and 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 you've gone through so many changes during the course of those years that we do we do actually lose ourselves and we also change every year we change every country we change every child we change and you're so right, the phases change. So, you you know, the days of the toddlers and the babies and the feeding and the, the puree everywhere. Well, now <laughs> I'm back at, I don't need babysitters anymore. I'm right. at that gorgeous phase where yes. the kids are still at home. They're great to chat to, but I don't need babysitters. Mm -hmm. So we get to go out loads more. Well, right. now suddenly I need go out clothes. Yeah, which you probably haven't need needed any. for years. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and each new phase, you know, I worked for my husband for a number of years before I restarted my business here in the south of France, and I was working in an office, but now I'm standing up, I'm speaking, I'm doing different things that I haven't done for a while, and I had to refresh my wardrobe and find things that work here in the south of France. And the climate in Singapore was so different compared to the climate here. So... Yes, um, a lot of people travel all over the world now and there's changes happening all the time and people's style evolve, their personality changes, their, everything is evolving all the time. So it's about keeping up with those and finding yourself again. Well, you know, and I know we're going to meet up for a workshop that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And also I'm coming to your studio to try yes, I'm and I'm excited to have you. <laughs> Me too. You. I'm excited because it, I see this as being in my personal goals of giving myself some time back, which I don't do, haven't mm -hmm. been doing, but I am going to do. So Fantastic. So I can't wait to, to have it. you, Antonia. <laughs> what were some of the challenges that you've had when you were setting up Lane Image Consulting and running it in those, you know, the last couple of years? Well, I think all the challenges, first of all, were completely in my own head. 
and um, <laughs> nothing to do with anyone else or real challenges that were actually out there. Um, you know, I, I had run my own business in Singapore for eight years, which was pretty successful. And then I had my first child and I continued to run my business. And then I had my second child who proved to be um, quite demanding and difficult and didn't really sleep for many years. So I stopped my business and I started working part time for my husband for a number of years. And it wasn't my passion and it wasn't my goal. And I didn't feel that it was you know, what my purpose in life that I really feel that my purpose in life is helping other wo women be more confident. I really feel very strongly about that. And um, I do now, but I kind of lost myself a little bit in between when I stopped working for my husband, moved to the south of France and kind of faffed around looking for something, knowing that there was something missing from my life, but didn't really know what wasn't quite in the place where um, I could conceive of restarting my business because I thought, well, everybody speaks French. I don't really have fluent French. Uh, where will I find clients? You know, I, I, I really think it was all about limitations in my own mind and it had nothing to actually do with what, what actually is here. Um, so once I kind of got over that in my own mind and once I kind of found myself again, talking about finding ourselves. I think uh, once I decided, I kind of knew it was the right decision, it felt right, and it's just been amazing since. It's just been, It's you know, huge, isn't it, mindset? Resetting huge. your mindset. I'll put a note in the show notes. Uh, Natalie Ekdal, who was my mentor, uh, for many years I followed, listened to her podcast, The Biz Chicks, and then I worked with her on strategy calls and in masterminds. And then I went out to America and was part of her big Biz Chicks Live conference. Now, I know wow. from chatting to you before, you have a mentor in the UK. And it changes, doesn't it? How it because you have someone that can sort of hold a mirror up towards you and say, yeah, why are you thinking like this? And you suddenly realise it's yourself pulling yourself backwards. No one else is saying, you can't do this. You can't afford this. You're too big-headed. It's all coming from that inner oh, mean so girl. It's completely uh, manufactured, just a story in your head, completely made up, nothing to do with what's actually going on. So, yes, I did find um, a business mentor in the UK, um, specifically for image consultants, and she's just been amazing on the whole mindset thing. You know, she she just points out you know how you are limiting yourself so i would advise anybody at any stage in their life to look at getting a coach or a mentor of some sort to just because because it is so hard to be objective about ourselves you know it's it's so easy to just live in your story um it just is you know, I'll share with you, um, before Natalie Ekdal and I were working together, I never expanded Kidland. I kept thinking, I will. I will when the kids... Mm -hmm. And then in this, my mindset is always money. I was right. like, you can't afford it. It's going to be too expensive. And that was my mindset. And then a year and a half ago, I was in uh, the States at the, the Biz Chicks Live. And I was like, what do I want to do next year in 2018? And I was like, I really want to grow the business now. And I was like, yeah, but you can't afford it, you know, and I kept having that. So anyway, I wrote on a pebble the word grow, and it sat on my desk, and I came back, and I had a bracelet made saying believe, because even with that pebble, I kept still slipping back into my mindset if you can't do right. it. And these two things helped me to then open up what this part we're sitting in here, mm. um, so the loft, because I, so the mindset thing was I can't afford it. Well, I went to my mum and dad and I said, can you lend me some money to take on the rental of this new place and totally renovate it? You know, sort of 30,000 was the, right. what I needed really. And they just went, we believe in you, no problem. Brilliant. So then that gave me the confidence then to come and do it. The thing well, is, I never borrowed the money. I never needed the money. You never needed it. And that's what I have found. And yet I held myself back by it. Completely. It, the minute that we open ourselves to the possibility, things start appearing. You know, ways become open. 
you know, just there yesterday, I was just thinking, oh, I need to do something. I can't do it because of this. I can't do it because of that. And then I just kind of said to myself, remain open, leave, leave, leave it open. Just leave it as an idea there. I, I'm really looking at having um, an online component to my business. Um, and next thing, you know, when, once I relaxed and I forgot about it, all of a sudden things started you know, forming in my mind and, you know, things just start becoming available the second that you let go of the limitation and just allow it to be. You talked about a method before, a Sedona the method? The Sedona method. Actually, it was my husband that got me onto that, but uh, it's pretty powerful. It's changed my life for sure. Um, and it's just all about uh, the stories in our mind, really, and how they limit us, limit us and how... Nobody else has the same story. It's just completely made up. So it's all about just letting go of the stories and just being and being open to what's already here. Now, forget about the story in the past, the story of the tragedy or the drama or whatever it is, and just be here right now. So I highly re recommend the Sedona method. Um, I listen to it all the time on CDs in my car. I've been to several conferences in the US. Yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's like the law of attraction. It's, it's, it's kind of like the secret. Um, but the secret is very much uh, goal orientated, I think. Whereas uh, the Sedona method is more about having a goal, but then letting go. So you can set goals, it's no problem. And we all should set goals, I believe. But then it's about letting go of the outcome and allowing it to happen. So it's a bit like putting your idea out there. Yes, you know, with the end in mind, this is what I want to happen, and then trusting that the universe is going to take you to that point, and the right people will Correct. be put to help the, it the, 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 Everything just transpires then to move into place to to give you this outcome. Which again, the loft, I stood on the other side, so in the original, the annex side, this will be two and a half years ago, and I remember standing there going, I want that space next door. Right. Because it just ticked boxes that I needed. I would get more parking spaces. I was like, I remember exactly where I was standing. I was like, I want that space. Didn't do anything about it. And then a year and a half later, the opportunity came up and it was available. See, it opens it, it opens your mind and allows things in. And it, Whereas I think receptive. the limitations, yeah. yeah, the limitations just... It, it might have come in a different form to what, how you thought perhaps it would come. Uh, but I think that once we let go of the limitations, we can see the opportunity. Whereas when we're holding on and focusing on the limitations, which is so easy to do if you're not really, really aware of your thoughts. Um, well, it's like the money thing. When my parents said, yes, we, we can sign a check, the mindset problem of money went. Yes. So I went ahead and did it and I never needed the money. There you but go. But I was holding myself back because I thought I did. Yes. So That's all you were focusing on, on, on yeah. what the limitation was. But the minute that that was removed, then other things came in. Yeah. And that's just the way I, how I see things So happening. I think mentors that can hold a mirror up to you, challenge your thought process, masterminds where you can work with other people on things, they are so constructive. It's the way forward, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. I, I swam on my own for ages, and it's only in the last couple of years that I've had this, and they're all women's sisterhood, Yes. They've been helping me forward in a non-conflictual, non-competitive, supporting, self-supporting way. It's, it's just amazing. amazing. I mean, even the networking group that um, Tiffany Butler runs. Yeah. It's just amazing. A group of like-minded women who are all moving in the same direction. We absolutely don't need to do it by ourselves. There are so many people out there that want to help us. I love that. So true. So tell us about one of your hell yeah, you go girl moments that you've had. Just this morning, I had one of those moments. You know, I turned up to give my talk at the little cafe. Um, I wasn't really expecting much. You know, there's, there's not, I don't know too many people here yet. I'm just getting word out there. And um, I came away having made a sale. That's never happened before on the spot. <laughs> that was worth so that your while was, going. Was worth my while going, and I came away and felt absolutely amazing. And 
And, and I think we, we have to make the best of the situation no matter what it is. Give your best, give more than what's expected and you will always get it back tenfold. I love that too. I'm going to write all these down. <laughs> I'm interested in hearing about how you've been integrating and being part of the, becoming a part of the community because it's recent for you. It's something I see discussed in my Facebook group, Cot As You're Living, because moving abroad and, and living abroad as an expat can be really tricky. How have you set about meeting people? It actually happened really easily for us. Uh, we live just behind the school in Mujan and we walk to school every day. We have two dogs. We walk to school every day. The boys cycle to school. And we, I just walk the dog twice a day and I just meet people in the woods, <laughs> which is my natural home, I believe. Um, <laughs> so I'm absolutely at my happiest when I'm out walking with the dogs and I just meet other like-minded uh, people. And I have just met, we've met so many people and we get invited to so many events and the boys are extremely happy here and they made friends really, really quickly. So I think where you're located is really, really important. We just happened to be located very near the school and near the woods and it's actually very, very central, I guess. And You mentioned earlier about speaking French. Yes. How have you been... <laughs> doing in that front to try and integrate into the French life. Okay, so <laughs> that's not such a positive uh, story, <laughs> you know. Um, well, I learned French in school, so I'm not completely without French. And I have been, I took lessons before Christmas, um, three, three days a week in Cannes. And that's definitely improved my French a little bit. And I can understand French a lot more. Um, I found that a lot of the French people here can speak English and we live around us as kind of a French community, you know, in the domain that we live or we live just outside the gate, but there's an equestrian centre, there's a little restaurant there. Have you joined any associations yet or is that something to come? I haven't joined any associations yet. I've looked at the professional women's network in Nice, but I really hate to go out at night. So... <laughs> I prefer um, organisations that I can join during the day. I've obviously joined uh, Tiffany's group of women, which I'm delighted with. I, I help out at school sometimes, but I haven't really joined any other organisations. It can yet. be tricky, can't it? Because there are many areas down here that are set up for English. In fact, there are people that have lived in Antibes for 20 years that don't speak any French and don't need to because... You can get by without it. You so can you definitely can get, by, get without by without it. I mean, most days we can get get by without it. And my husband has um, a French PA. So she helps us with paperwork. She helps us with, you know, dealing with the banks or whatever. So unfortunately, that's not helping in our quest to learn French. But it's finding that right thing. So me and Mr. BB, we went, Mark has to um, be part of the community in order to get his French citizenship. Right. So we've always been part of French schools and the French associations and then the kids have done activities. So we've been part of the different clubs, the football clubs, the handball clubs, that kind of thing. Anyway, now that you know the, the kids aren't really doing that, we had to find things for ourselves. And in Barcelou, there is a great little association called um, Les Ateliers du Loup. Uh, so the workshops for the loot area. Yes. And they're really into um, non-plastic, so anything that's not wrapped up. Okay. So they've started these Marché Nocturne on a Thursday night. It's an evening market. Went last weekend. It was uh, Last week it was great. Uh, and there were all these little stalls, so you can go and get your fresh produce, but you bring your bags along and they just okay, put it in wow. there. Uh, there was a woman selling lavender and all these different, like, essential oils and sprays which were perfect because I wasn't sleeping very well so I got one of these she made me up this whole concoction grown on the hillside in in the loop and all this exchanging was done in in French right. well from there actually because as soon as they'd hear me like you say as soon as they hear me speak to one of my kids in English they would switch into English even though my French is okay. that is the problem here now both boys are actually playing with local uh, clubs uh, Jack goes to US Valbon and Joe goes to, um, let me think of the name, Joan Le Pen Antibes Club. So that's completely in French. So, so the boys are actually picking it up really quickly. 
Um, and I think I've got myself to a certain level, but now I need to kind of, as you say, look to other means of, of improving my French. Well, yeah, and so we, through this association, went to a nut milk, how to make your own nut milk workshop. Oh, I saw that it's on really, Facebook. And it was so you. good. So good, because a year ago, I, my doctor told me I couldn't have any more cow protein. Okay. So I, could, I had to cut out dairy, that you know, cow, um, cow dairy. So I love my coffee in the morning, but I don't like black coffee. And so that's been tricky, trying to find the right thing to go it's, with it's it. It's really tricky, because most of the plant, uh, the nut milks, will separate yeah so almond milk will separate some of the ones and um, the commercial ones that are made with stabilizer will actually hold but i i actually went through that many years ago and um i don't think i actually found a solution did you find the solution well so i'm not supposed to have almonds either so so that oh. cuts out almond which is the closest tasting to cow milk right. so what we did is we got cashew nuts and so we went on this little workshop and it was just, the, you know, two English with all these French people. It was brilliant, really good. And she had her, um, what's it called, that Vitamix, you know, super, Vitamix, Vitamix yeah. uh, super duper thing. And cashew nuts, so 100 grams of cashew nuts, blended up with a litre of water, made you the most fantastic nut milk. And really creamy, because cashews yeah, it was are really creamy. And I, I only have a tiny bit in coffee and I... You know, I don't have bowls of cereal or anything And it like that. doesn't separate? Well, you can shake it up in your bottle. Right. So you can shake it up before you use it and do it. And then last night, with our blet, which I don't even know what they're called in English, maybe shard or something, that we got from the Nocturne Market, you know, like loads of this green leafy stuff. Okay. <laughs> Mark made a, made this up last night into a, a blet, a gratin, with hazelnut milk instead of normal milk. And it was delicious. Really, really good. Fantastic. So well chuffed. So we're ticking our French association <laughs> box and our non-dairy box and getting out and doing things. So it was really good. Um, if you were a newbie or you met a newbie right now, what would you tell them to go and see on the Côte d'Azur? My favourite thing to do is go to the sea. I love the sea. So I would say go to either Joan Le Pen, which is what I do every Saturday morning when my son is playing football. I just walk along the front of Joanne Le Pen. I also love Tiol Sur Sur Mayer. Uh, absolutely love the walk there and the view. And I especially love it in the winter when there's no one else there. Yeah. Um, so I take the dog and we walk along and it's just absolutely beautiful there. So yes, I would advise them to go to the sea. What's, that's great and they're two of my favourite places we're so lucky to have so many what's on your bucket list of places to still see and do well we haven't been to Italy since we got here so um, I would really really like to go to Italy uh, up to see the market Ventimiglio am I mm -hmm, saying, yeah, saying that correctly yeah, yeah. yeah I'm saying that correctly and um, apparently Andrea Botticelli runs his own concert in his hometown every summer so i'm organizing not next summer but the following summer to have some friends come and we're going to go and see andrew andrea Bot botticelli in That'd his be own amazing <laughs> wow in his own town yeah so i'm really really that is definitely on my bucket list it's a do. unique thing i think here to be you know how many hours are we from spain four hours or something from spain we're in France, we've got Corsica, just a boat ride away, and Italy. Yes, it's just amazing. It's incredible to have and so much And we've had so, so many place. visitors already, you know, people from Switzerland, from Alsace, from Ireland. <laughs> I was in Singapore for 18 years and we didn't see very many visitors because it's such a, a huge flight. But everyone wants to come and stay with us in France. <laughs> <laughs> They are great things to add to everybody's bucket list to go and see and do. And even if we've been here for ages, I haven't been to Ventimiglia for ages. And it's a really fun day out to go to the market or San Remo as well. I mentioned earlier about workshops. So a little project that I decided to put together is Culture Club Riviera. So it's a Facebook starting point group. But really the idea is people connect in person. And it's really new. It's just a little baby, a little one of those little ideas that formulated in my head of Okay, I've done all the kids' activities here. We've got all the kids sorted, you know, huge tick there. What do I want now? Because that's my thing, is setting up businesses that I can use for myself. Well, that's what I've always done. Right. So now I'm like at this age of 45 plus where I'm like, okay, I need a new image. Tick. 
like <laughs> I need to get fit. Lee and uh, Faye and everyone are helping me do that. Tick and Amanda. Um, I decided that I wanted to do a flower arranging course, but not like my grandma did every week with like, you know, Oasis and that was a bit naff and Women's Institute. Just a one-off spectacular spray that I could take home and go, yes, this is what I did today, darling. <laughs> Alongside take working. one good picture. <laughs> take one good social media ready photo. Yeah. <laughs> no. Tick. So Claire Lyons from Dandelions and Grace is coming in March. And that sold out straight away. I was so excited. So is she. Me too, because it's something that I have wanted to do actually for a long time. So I must get to paying for that. <laughs> yeah, and it's just a fun moment as well where if you want to meet other people, going to a coffee morning can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes because you think, oh, I don't have the small talk or what am I going to say or yes. do. And actually when you've got a little activity to do, it's a great way to have something to keep you focused and keep your attention. But then you get, oh, I kind of like that person. I want to get to know them a bit more. That was kind of funny. That happened in one of the painting courses that we did with um, Hein and Vizzi. I met someone, Michonne. Hi, Michonne. And I just, she just made me laugh so much while we were painting our bits of furniture. Yes. That I was like, I really want to connect with you more outside of this. So it's a great way and non, you know... It's, not it really is. It's fantastic. And, and even just for networking, you know, it's, it's such a... Um, an easy thing to do. It's not confrontational if you're doing an activity together. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it also. Yes, and so we are going to be doing in April, and I think it's uh, Thursday, 4th of April, we're partnering up to run a tonal workshop. That's which right. Which is not, not toning our abs, it's tonal <laughs> in colour, this one. So what would someone coming along to that be expecting to do? Okay, so it's, um, it's the Colour Tonal Taster Workshop, and when you come along to that, I will put you into one of six color groupings and you will learn your dominant color characteristic. So I, you will be coming away with 18 colors that you can wear immediately, that are safe colors, um, that you can spruce up your wardrobe with. And have lots of fun and it's going to be just a little taster. It's just a taster into the world of color analysis, but it's great fun. You will meet people, you will be moving around the room, you will be networking, and it's just great fun. I love running them. Um, yeah, just great fun and learning something and coming away with something. So it's going to be our midlife kick-ass girls get-together, having a bit of quality time, <laughs> friendly faces, learning something. And I've already got people that have contacted me signing up for that, so I'm super Fantastic. excited. Fantastic, that's what I like that. to hear. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, how would it differ, differ from an 80s colour workshop thing that... Oh, like Colour Me Beautiful, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so all of those workshops that were run in the 80s, the late 70s, early 80s, they were actually franchises and mostly they were trying to sell makeup. Whereas I don't really do makeup. While I will advise you what makeup colours suit you, I don't really do makeup. Um, and oftentimes you were able to buy a scarf there, you know, in the colours that suit you. So colour analysis now, very, very different. It's about um, expressing your unique personality and working with the colours, obviously, that suit you, but wearing the, them in a way that uh, speaks about who you are. And just as you're saying that, I'm like, actually, the 80s was 40 years ago. Things have moved on. <laughs> Things like, have most huge. definitely moved on. Even this uh, tonal, tonal color analysis that I do now is very, very new. It's a new system. It, it's a new system in that it's presented a little bit differently, but it's based on the same principles from back in 1970. The, the, the basic principles haven't really changed, uh, but how we... Um, show people the colours that suit them has obviously moved on significantly since then. What I would love to see, this is the next step, is the shops. You know, you can go online and, and say, I want to look for a jacket in blue. I'd love yes. to be able to go, I would like to have it in like a cool blue <laughs> or, you know, in your colour yes. shades because you yes. get shown all the... You do. Unfortunately, the shops really haven't moved to that yet. So I really focus on um, showing people how to find the colors that suit them themselves and the words that they need to use to find those colors. 
Um, so it's all about now, you know, not using your little color swatches anymore. It's more about being able to recognize the colors that suit you. So we talked about the Sedona method, something that you listen to. What's an inspirational quote that you would that comes into your mind day to day? Okay, so I use um, "Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway" quite often. This was a book I probably read thirty years ago by Susan Jeffers, and she was just an amazing woman and um, it just applies to any challenge that you have really whether it's standing up and, and speaking or whether it's you know changing job or starting a business or getting your colors done feel the fear and do it anyway I just use it all the time it's a great one. I do that five, four, three, two, one, do it because I get scared sometimes. <laughs> Everyone gets scared sometimes and that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine to get scared, but don't let it stop you. Quick fire. Are you a book or box set? Book. Flats or heels? Flats. Skis or swimsuit? Ooh, swimsuit. <laughs> if I have to. <laughs> in the right colour, I'm guessing. Yes, in the, in the right colour, in the right cut. <laughs> Can or Cumbria? Can. And Moet or Mocha? Mocha. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think we've really got to know you, Eileen. Um, how can people get in touch if they want to find out more? The best way to get hold of me is by email. And I'm at, on Aileen at laneimageconsultant.com. And I'm sure Antonio will provide that email address for you. Very difficult to get me by phone because I tend to have it on silent a lot of the time. Me too. <laughs> so I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Um, just either look for Aileen Lane or Lane Image Consulting and you will definitely find me. And like you say, everything's going to be in the show notes so that if people are listening on their podcast app... They can click on the description, scroll down a bit, and you can get all the links that way. Fantastic. Well, Eileen, I cannot wait to do a little bit of tonal uh, colours with you in April. I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you very much for joining us on the Riviera Firefly podcast. Thank you, Antonio. The Riviera Firefly podcast appreciates every contributor and listener. Your comments, likes, and shares make us really happy and inspire us to keep doing the shows. Come join us in our free community groups on Facebook, Côte d'Azur Living, or all things south of France. And for those running a business, you need to join the Riviera Firefly Business Cocoon. It's totally free. The cost of producing and hosting this podcast are funded by Kiddyland. Nicknamed by their clients, The Little English School, they organise fun activities all in English for 0 to 16 year olds from baby clubs and playgroups to English lessons and holiday camps. They even hold workshops for adults too, right here on the Côte d'Azur. You can find out more about Kiduland directly on their website, www.kiduland.com. So thanks for listening. Please do pay it forward and share an episode so we can spread the Côte d'Azur love. Until next time, Fireflies, au revoir.